According to the chaos report from the Standish Group, small projects of under 50 participants are 30% more likely to be successful with Agile practices, and large projects of more than 50 people are over 200% more likely to be successful. Hopefully this short video will help you identify the key differences that make this possible. My name's Martin Hinchewood. I'm a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org, professional Kanban trainer with Pro Kanban, and I've been a Microsoft MVP in DevOps for 14 years. So we have the traditional model, the empirical model, and we're going to look at that within the context of uh, visibility, right? How much visibility do our stakeholders have? We're going to talk about change, operational risk, and realized value. So let's focus on visibility. At the beginning of a product life cycle in a traditional model, we're going to have high visibility. We're creating that documentation. We're showing the customer, liaising with the customer on what it is we're going to, going to create. And then at the end of the product cycle, we also have high visibility, right? The customer's got a delivered usable working product that solves their business problem, right? That would be the expectation at the end of that, that time period. But in between those two points, we largely go dark, right? There might be touch points with the customer. We're going to show you the documentation. Uh, we have little demos that we might do of different parts of the product in isolation, but they don't really get a holistic visibility about what's going on, where we are. We're just telling them. So we tend to go fairly low visibility, not to zero, right? But fairly low visibility. And then at the end of the product cycle, it jumps up as we deliver a usable working product. However, for visibility in an empirical model, we're actually going to start in exactly the same place and we're going to end in exactly the same place, right? We have high visibility at the end because they've got a usable working product. We've got high visibility at the start because we've got documentation potentially, right? But at the end of every single iteration, we're going to be providing the customer with a usable working product, right? That's how we mitigate risk. It's the minimum bar for an empirical process. Minimum bar for Scrum is a usable working product at the end of every sprint. So in fact, during each iteration, we've got that low visibility, but we jump back up on a regular cadence as we're delivering usable working product to the customer. So they get these many touch points where they're able to make assertions, change direction, um, have a different understanding of what's going on. Now let's look at our ability to change. Our ability to change, uh, I would quantify that as um, our, the implications and our ability to accept change into the system, right? We're creating product, so as we build more product, we have less ability to change because each change has a bigger and bigger impact. Um, and in a traditional model, our ability to change is very high at the start. And at the end, it's very low, right? We have, if we finished the product, we've spent our 12 months working on it. We've delivered the usable working product. We've deployed it to production. We now no longer um, have an ability to, to change it unless there's more funding, more budget. But, very quickly, as we get started building the documentation, the more documentation we build, the more impact change has, right? A small change could have a massive impact on all the documentation we've created. So our ability to, to, to change drops very quickly. And then we start actually building product and perhaps we build the entire database first or we build the uh, database and then the mid tier, right? And then the uh, 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 interface uh, that customers are going to interact with. And we're building it uh, constantly and we've kind of started everything. So our ability to change drops again, it never drops to zero, right? Um, but throughout the life of the product, it stays very low. So it drops very quickly and then stays very low across the life of the product. Our ability to change in the empirical model, again, starts in the same place and finishes in the same place, right? We've got a time limited uh, uh, product cycle. But what happens during that product cycle is our ability to change remains higher, right? Higher. It's still going to drop, 
right? Because every time we deliver a usable working product, the things that we've already built are harder to change than things we haven't built yet. But because we're building in those vertical slices, creating working usable product that the customer can deploy to production, each of those vertical slices allows the other 90%, uh, 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 right, at the end of sprint one, the rest of the backlog, the stuff we've not created yet, can really can change anything they want with very little impact, right? Because we haven't built copious amounts of documentation, we haven't built copious amounts of product yet, so they can change anything they want. So the idea is that the ability to change is still going to drop sprint on sprint, but it does remain much higher all the way through the life of the product and obviously ends in the same place. Now let's look at operational risk. An operational risk in a traditional model, we're gonna start high operational risk, right? Because we've not delivered anything. And then when we deliver our usable working product at the end of our product cycle, 12 months, we're going to have uh, zero operational risk because we've deployed a working product for them. I know there's an assumption there, but uh, let's, let's assume the best. Um, and then over the life of the product, we've actually got very high operational risk. If we're six months into our product cycle, what operational risk for the customer have we alleviated? Zero, right? No operational risk. So it needs to remain high during the life of the product. And then right at the end, we deliver that working usable version of the product, right? So we alleviate all of their operational risk in one big chunk. In an empirical process for operational risk, again, we start high and again, we finish low. But every sprint, we're providing a usable working product. So the operational risk gets a little bit less. At the end of sprint two, it gets a little bit less again because we've delivered usable working product that solves their business problem. And we end up with that straight line from top left to bottom right. Right? Every sprint, we're alleviating some of that operational risk. Now, in reality, we should alleviate it quicker if we as a team are focusing on delivering the most valuable things that that customer needs to know first. So that operational risk might, might be more of a curve but let's assume it's a, it's a straight line. Let's take a pessimistic view that each sprint, we just alleviated that sprint's operational risk. Finally, let's talk about realized value, the delivery of value to the customer. So in a traditional model, um, we have zero value at the start of the product cycle. We deliver a working product to production at the end. So we have our, our usable uh, working product that perhaps we delivered our 300 features that the customer asked for um, and how do we how do we get there well we're only delivering to production at the end right the customer can only use the product once it's in production it only adds value once it's in production so in fact we're not delivering anything during the life of the project and then right at the end they get their usable working product obviously it always works with their 300 features in it that are exactly what they asked for and uh, they're they're happy because they got that realized value at the end. But maybe there's a better way because what did we learn uh, a little bit earlier in this discussion? We learned that 35% of those features are used by the customer at the end of that product cycle. Only 35%, right? That's like 90, 100, 110 of those 300 items are actually used at the end of the product cycle. That's not particularly great. So what could we do instead? Using an empirical process, there's actually two ways to draw this graph. One is that we're going to start at uh, zero value, just the same, and we're gonna end at those 300 features. So this assumes that we're doing an empirical process inside of a traditional organization or working for a traditional customer. The customer says, here's these 300 features, we've added them to the contract, right? And then that's what we're gonna build. And we're not gonna, the very low variance of change, right? Cause we're gonna put barriers in their way, like change request boards and 
uh, uh, cost, you know, having to do a business case to make a change, all of those things. We're gonna we're gonna just deliver those uh, 300 features. But at the end of every sprint, we're actually able to deliver them some value, right? So at the end of each sprint, here is some value. Here's a product that you can deploy to production that solves some of your business problem, right? Not all of it, but some of your business problem. And every single sprint, we're delivering a working usable product along that line, right? So the customer is able to get value from it sooner. So if you think about the, the realization of value at the end of sprint three, they've got three sprints worth of value, how much of their business problem is alleviated already? And we're not at the 12 month mark. 12 month mark. We're one quarter of the way through the product cycle and we've, we've alleviated one quarter of the business problem. Right? They're adding value as we go along. So they've had the value for longer is what I mean. It's not sitting on a shelf because we're able to deploy to production. But there's indeed a superpower there because only 35% of those 300 features are used. So we actually don't want to build those, those 300 features. We want to build a different 300 features, right? Even if we just get to that 300 mark. So what happens is at the end of sprint one, we remove things from the backlog that we no longer need. Perhaps the customer has realized that they asked for stuff they don't need. Perhaps the market's changed and they no longer need that. Perhaps a business decision has been made, right? There was a branching decision. This way was one set of 100 features. This way was another set of 100 features. So they added them all to the backlog, but now they've made that decision and it's this one. So we can delete these 100, right? So we delete those things and we don't build some of those things and we take it in a different direction, right? We add more value sooner in the product cycle as we go and perhaps we hit that mark of the same 35% of value much sooner. Perhaps we hit it in month five, right? We could stop there and have delivered the same value that we would have delivered in a traditional model, but at five twelfths of the price. And my math's not good, right? Five twelfths of the price. But what often happens is in the product cycle, we continue to build features, different features based on the needs of the business, based on collaborating with customers and stakeholders, and we add way more value to the product. That's if we're using an empirical process within an organization, within a structure that is accepting of that level of change. And that is what we want to get from an agile process. So even using an agile process inside of a traditional organization, we get value, we maximize visibility, we maximize our ability to respond to the changing needs of the customer, we minimize their operational risk, and we continually deliver value that that customer can amortize over time, right? Those are the superpowers of Agile, even within a traditional organization. If we can change the organization as well, we can get even more. Well, thanks very much for listening. If you're interested in uh, 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 reading a little bit more in depth into this story of Agile, um, I really recommend the new new product development game. It's a Harvest Business Review article from 1986. It's available free online. Um, and I also recommend Stephen Denning's book, The Age of Agile. If you would like to get in touch with me, uh, please use this QR code right here uh, to book a 30 minute free consultation with me and we can figure out how we can make your world a little bit better.